Greetings, Internets. This is episode 3 of my series on refuting bread tubers from a stance of objective reason, focused primarily on ContraPoints, who is best described as a progressive philosopher who puts a lot of effort into the visual quality and stage presentation of her videos, so I can definitely understand her popularity even though I don't agree with much of her content. She also makes an effort not to be totally condescending, which immediately makes her less annoying than Vosh, so that's some positive things I can at least credit ContraPoints on before getting into the main issue. Which is that ContraPoints is someone whose content I have found to be a major example of an extremely common and very intellectually dishonest grift that can be found pretty much everywhere in the greater circle of progressive thought. It's something I will refer to in this video as the progressive slippery slope, and it basically goes like this. When it comes to political discourse, you can divide just about anything regarding any idea into three sections. Not hateful, such as constructive criticism, light humor, and other non-aggressive concepts. Criticism that is questionable and may or may not have a harmful intent, but could be mistaken as such, so it's questionable. And outright hostility and hate, such as claiming that those in support of the subject need all be thrown off the edge of a cliff. The way this grift works is that progressives will often try to discredit anything that does not sit well with wokeness by performing mental gymnastics and forming slippery slope arguments for why things they don't like that are in the green area are actually secretly in the red area, or will eventually slide to the red area, somehow. Basically, they will take a standard conservative right wing or sometimes even a centrist stance or ideology and attempt to debunk it by convincing you it will lead to fascism or some other form of bigotry, when in reality it will not. This is a problem because slippery slopes are not very good arguments, and are generally considered fallacious unless strong evidence was presented that the slope from point A truly does logically flow to point C. By using this dishonest reasoning, the cult of folk can avoid having to deal with valid criticism against their beliefs, or ideologies they don't agree with but cannot defeat intellectually. By conflating constructive criticism and silly memes with outright hatred and pretending that they are the same thing. For instance, a painfully obvious example is when Adam Something, another bread tuber, made an entire video about how people on the libertarian right are actually fascists, which he based on a mountain of disinformation and a blatant lack of understanding of what libertarianism even means. But that again is an obvious example, one that has been thoroughly debunked by Libertarian Scott, where he meticulously pointed out how just about every single sentence Adam Something uttered was either factually untrue or logically absurd. ContraPoints, on the other hand, is much smarter than Adam something, which admittedly isn't a high bar, but her uses of the progressive slippery slope are often much more subtle, far more manipulative, elaborate, and thus much more difficult for the average person to spot. But the reality is, ContraPoints relies on this type of argument so often that when you take it away from her, well, I'll save that for the final. For now, let's just take a look at some of ContraPoints' videos and takes, and how most of them rely on this grift in one way or another. We will start with a straightforward one, a video on how to recognize a fascist. Contemporary fascists share three core beliefs. One, people of European heritage are or ought to constitute a biological, cultural, and political unity known as the white race, sometimes dog-whistled as Western culture. Two, Jews are masterminding the destruction of the white race through multiculturalism and non-white immigration, a plot that fascists call white genocide or ethnic replacement. Three, the only way to save the white race is to establish a white homeland, or ethnostate, from which non-whites and degenerates must be per. First off, the definition of fascism in this video doesn't actually fit fascism, but more accurately describes white supremacists. But white supremacists are fairly cringe and silly too, so I'll let this technicality slide even if it's not really correct will have to be more subtle and indirect. Shortly after the Charlottesville rally, a post titled Fixing the Alt-Right appeared on Poll, the image board where millennial Nazis talk strategy and trade pictures of Japanese nymphats. The post outlines some basic fascist strategy. Backfires. So you say stuff like forced busing, states' rights, and all that stuff. You're getting so abstract now that you're talking about cutting taxes and all these things. They'll talk about preserving Western civilization or Western culture. And it's considered hate speech to advocate purging non-white people. They'll talk instead about purging immigrants, criminals, rapists, and terrorists, and leave it to the audience to catch the color coding on their own. Modern fascists have taken to using almost arbitrary emoji as a way to wink and nod at each other, notably the frog after Pepe, the milk, and the OK sign. So it doesn't matter what the symbols are. In fact, it's important that the symbols constantly change so that normies don't catch on. Here's a uniquely millennial twist on the racist dog whistle. You shroud your sincere ideas in cartoon characters and memes, and then when called out, you mock your accuser for being a clueless normie who isn't in on the joke. Strategy 6. Irony. 
jokes, satire, and memes. The fact that they publicly denounce fascism should be worth absolutely nothing to you and shouldn't even enter into your consideration of whether they're a fascist. After all, I'm not a fascist is exactly what a fascist would say. Let's plot this reasoning out on the progressive slippery slope chart. We have in the green things like Western culture, cutting taxes, purging criminals and rapists. We have in the questionable section some edgy 4chan memes, white identitarians, and immigration restriction. And in the red would be actual national socialism and white supremacists. Now, did contrapoints include any verifiable study or data analysis that proves the majority of people who support the things at the top of this list are secretly fascist or will at least fall down this slippery slope to national socialism? Uh, no. No, she did not. Feel free to watch her entire video yourself. Not once does she give any reasonable data analysis that shows just how likely any person who believes these things will end up joining the phantom underground fascist boogeyman brigade that we are being presented with here. So her points are entirely just subjective conjecture. Instead of verifiable evidence, we got a random post from 4chan that could have been written by anyone. Therefore, regular people perceived as being on the right who claim they are not fascists may in fact secretly be fascists. This reasoning is ludicrous. Because at the end of the day, it's the actual statistics that really matter. What percentage of Pepe Frog meme spammers are actually fascist? 99%? 50%? 10%? Here's the reality, if the number of people who are secret fascists was anywhere near as high as ContraPoints is implying here, people like Richard Spencer would have a far greater following, as opposed to be considered the total laughingstock even amongst the right that he is. Even if you go to right-wing places like Gab, the majority of people there are not interested in National Socialism. Gab has about 4 million users and only a few thousand or so are actually members of fascist groups. This is roughly a tenth of a percent. Even the beekeeper community on Gab is significantly larger than this. It's all sort of a reverse McCarthyism, where instead of laying groundwork for interpreting anything remotely leftist as Marxism, ContraPoints is laying the groundwork to interpret anything remotely right as National Socialism and Fascism. The entire video is therefore nothing more than leftist fearmongering. And yes, it's obvious that's what's going on here, because towards the end of the video, ContraPoints has a fascist version of herself swapped to a MAGA hat. The obvious implication is that there is a significant pipeline from mainstream Republicans to fascism. Again, no real evidence is presented to show what the percentage of likelihood is for this pipeline to actually happen, or any hard data at all for that matter for any of the points she has mentioned suggests that the chances of people expressing the less extreme views presented are secret fascists is anything higher than fractions of a percent. This type of rationale where loosely interpreted connections and associations are accepted as valid evidence in the absence of any real data is a rationale that can be used to justify calling anything or anyone a secret fascist, and then claiming that's exactly what a fascist would say when they deny it. This is a very common tactic known as a Kafka trap, which is an extremely bad faith and unfalsifiable argument where a person's denial of their guilt is seen as somehow evidence of their guilt. And what's so dangerous about this particular use of the progressive slippery slope is that it manipulates people into becoming incapable of holding a conversation with the other side. How exactly can a conservative and a leftist talk about anything if the leftist has been effectively brainwashed by this nonsense into viewing the conservative's MAGA hat as some kind of extremist stealth fascist symbol? The reality is, they can't. Power level. So in a sense, yes, I am a little bit paranoid. The other day, the ACLU tweeted a picture of an adorable blonde child with the caption, this is the future ACLU members want. And for a second I was like, what the fuck? Because it has a close resemblance to a 14 words meme. But of course it's unintentional, it's the ACLU. I wanted to make sure, unlike most politicians. Yes, I have become crazy. Well, to her credit, at least she admits it. So let's move on. Up next will be her video on what is wrong with capitalism. general sense today among young people that we have been lied to, and that sense is perhaps the most acute among middle-class white men, who apparently were promised that they could be millionaires, or movie gods, or rock stars. The term special snowflake is used today as a slur against queer teenagers, but it comes from the movie Fight Club, where it refers to a generation of white guys who have become adults only to find that they're worse off than their fathers, voted half my channel to chronicling the deranged consequences of this situation, and 
anti-feminism, alpha males, pickup artists, the surreal surge in support for a white ethnic homeland. But till now, I haven't talked about the underlying causes, and it's important to do that because the thing is, the white men aren't even wrong that society is screwing them in some way. It's just that it's screwing everyone else even more. So the masculinist alt-right analysis of society is exactly upside down. Guys, you are not under the thumb of a Jewish feminist plot to turn you into girly soy boy cucks. Cultural Marxism did not turn you into placid IKEA consumers. Capitalism did. So what you need to do is stop scapegoating non-whites, feminists, and trans people and unite with the rest of us to actually do One thing I have noticed about people who push for collectivist identity politics is they tend to do a very bad job of refuting identity politics from the other side. Probably because doing so would force them to self-reflect as trying to justify identity politics you like while demonizing the identity politics you don't like almost always results in a self-contradictory argument. So they are generally forced into making this very strange claim that the identity politics they support will lead to some magical unicorn land happy place while demonizing the id poll they do not like. The extreme irony here is that it's this very demonization that is likely the actual reason for the existence of the alt-right. The alt-right is more or less a white collectivist response to anti-white identity politics such as the progressive stack back in the Occupy Wall Street movement where the value of what you have to say is considered less important based on your skin color and other perceived identities based on where you fall on their ridiculously subjective collective guilt and collective victimhood rankings. Or another good example would be in this very video on capitalism where counterpoints portray the straight white male boogeyman as being a bunch of entitled jerks who think they deserve to be millionaires and only care about themselves. And more ironically, there is solid evidence that this type of identity politics is the true reason the Occupy movement failed. As it turns out, when people are collectively demonized, they are more likely to collectivize against the group threat. So what's really upside down here is the progressive's understanding of social justice. They think that we somehow need to determine and acknowledge who is standing in more shit first before we can move forward, when in reality, this just results in various identity groups collectivizing against each other and bickering amongst themselves for victim status. This is why identity politics sucks and why collectivism is generally a bad idea. These kinds of standing and shit arguments are always idiotic when you understand the flaws of collective averages. No, the evil straight white male boogeyman does not have it easier than everyone else. The individuals who have it harder are the ones who have it harder, and the individuals who have it easier are the ones who have it easier. This is why seeing someone who is an elitist talk about identity-based privilege comes across as so cringy. There is an innate, rational part of our mind that sees this lunacy and suspects that maybe, just maybe, these people are full of shit. The harsh reality is that the Cult of Woke didn't expose the alt-right. They helped create the alt-right by pushing for the lunacy that is intersectionality are primarily concerned with the state of the human soul under capitalism, with the alienation of working not for yourself but for an employer who appropriates the value of your work, with the fetishism of commodities, the investment of inanimate objects with transcendent properties beyond their usefulness. You've lived your life in America, you've spent every day since birth assailed from all directions by propaganda campaigns for cereals and cigarettes and sugar snacks, and now you can't get no satisfaction. Jesus, people have been complaining about advertising so long it's come to seem like a basic feature of the human condition. But it's not a basic feature of the human condition. It's a situation particular to life under capitalism. I mean, North Korea is a dystopian shithole, but at least the train station isn't cluttered up with advertisements for- Oh. Whiny, entitled white bitches who don't understand that you're just a lackey without any actual power. And the system is organized so that people with no power just have to pointlessly shout at each other. For her take on how this applies to capitalism, I'm actually not going to spend too much time on this because, honestly, there's not much new here. Natalie does not pretend to be an economist like Marxian economicist Richard Wolff does from the previous episode. So instead, she is attacking the free market from the angle of philosophy, which isn't automatically bad, but it's kind of an issue. She commits the extremely common reasoning error that problems caused by things like scarcity in the human condition would magically go away or at least be greatly reduced if we went with socialism instead. This rationale is erroneous because it works by presupposing that capitalism is what leads to all of these problems. The reality is, things like advertising are profitable because mankind is susceptible to suggestion from our environment. We see a picture of a chocolate lava cake and it reminds us of how delicious chocolate lava cakes are, and we suddenly want some chocolate, so we buy it. This is just how human beings are. Getting 
rid of capitalism won't change the suggestibility of the average human, and we know this because it has existed throughout the history in some form. The difference is that in countries that do not have a free market, or some form of capitalist system based on private ownership, instead of advertising delicious chocolate, you generally just get propaganda. For instance, in North Korea, instead of advertisement billboards suggesting you should stop by and eat at a steakhouse in 10 miles, you get posters around town reminding you to worship the dear leader. I don't know about anyone else, but I much prefer the steakhouse. This idea that getting rid of the markets will somehow resolve the various psychological problems of humanity is yet another example of utopian wishful thinking. Sorry, but that existential dread is going to stay with you for life. Best get used to it. Next, let's look at the claim that Joanne Rowling is being transphobic. Truly the last thing we needed was the author of Harry Potter coming forward to announce there's two things she can't stand. Bigotry and the transgenders. Or maybe you heard that all Joanne did was say biological sex is real, and now crazy gender ideologues and trans activists are trying to silence her. And looking over Joanne's tweets, I don't think the average person would see any problem with what she's said. However, I mean, not to be condescending, but I feel like the average person's understanding of transgender is still a little bit... I don't really get the whole trans thing. I stand with Maya, referencing Maya Forstadter. Maya Forstadter is an English consultant who lost her contract with the nonprofit she worked for after she did transphobic tweets. And sex is real is a euphemism designed to present Maya Forstadter's transphobia as a simple statement of fact basic common sense, which only crazy activists and ideologues would oppose. There's a lot of stuff in these tweets that might seem innocent enough to the average person, but which to someone who understands bigotry against trans people raises a red flag. Bigotry has a history. The foundational turf text is feminist professor Janice Raymond's 1979 book, The Transsexual Empire, The Making of the Sh Male, in which Raymond argues that, quote, All transsexuals rape women's bodies by reducing the real female form to an artifact, appropriating this body for themselves. So this is how I see the progressive slippery slope for the trans issue. In the green era, you would have genuine criticism, such as concern over biological males competing in women's sports, and the scientifically supported belief that this objectively grants an unfair competitive advantage, and genuine concerns over things like dating choice. In the questionable section, I would again put edgy 4chan memes or arguing that it's just a fetish. Then in the red would be things such as a desire to outlaw, transgender, or outright hatred of a person just for being trans or restriction of people's rights for being trans. Now, as someone who leans towards the libertarian right, I don't take any issue with someone being trans. I only take an issue with someone trying to use their identity politics to silence others. And of course, this continued woke scold false equivalence of legitimate concerns to hostility. J.K. Rowling's tweets that earned infamy were specifically in defense of Maya Forestator's criticism of transgender athletes. Basic argument is that people born as biologically male generally have major advantages in physical sports over women, and so an MTF transgender individual competing in women's sports, which are segregated largely because of these physical advantages will carry said advantages with them, creating issues within the competition. And this has already caused some controversy, with multiple MTF transgender athletes smashing women's records and taking first place. This is a very touchy subject, because in the context of sports competition, it's kind of a zero-sum game. Sports are generally not like economics, where one's success is not dependent on another's failure. In most cases, there is only one gold medal. And the thing is, ContraPoints is educated enough to understand this so she should know that this issue is a 100% legitimate concern. It is not some secret, bigoted, fascist dog whistle to talk about transgender athletes in the sense that J.K. Rowling was defending. So instead, Natalie misrepresents the sex is real phrase in this conversation to be about chromosomes and gender identity. That's pretty strange considering J.K. Rowling never mentioned anything about chromosomes, and also very clearly stated that she respects trans women's gender identity. What ContraPoints is doing here is completely avoiding the subject of MTFs in women's sports. Yep, that's right, Natalie, for the most part, ignores the subject of sports in her entire rant. Not a single serious mention. How exactly one makes an hour and 30 minute long video about the transgender's views of JK Rowling without going over the transgender athletes is anyone's guess. But mine would be that this is a case of lying by omission. Natalie probably knows that subject isn't one that can be scientifically defended, so she avoids the subject altogether. This is incredibly deceptive, and unfortunately has been mirrored in the media. I see a lot of woke journalists seething over JK Rowling while completely ignoring the athletics question. Again, because they can't defend that position on a factual basis, so 
instead they deliberately misdirect away from it. Another thing Natalie does in this video is she goes in depth into some of the more absurd things said by people JK Rowling retweeted, as if retweeting someone once means you automatically agree with their stance on everything else they have ever tweeted or tweet in the future kinda silly. She also goes over some crazy nonsense by other unrelated TERFs such as the ramblings of Janice Raymond, all to once again try and justify her slippery slope. The implication here is that what JK Rowling is saying will eventually slide to what these people are slaying, which I sincerely doubt, and I'm confident enough in this that I actually 100% promise to delete this section of my video if JK Rowling ever decides that she agrees with the absurd quote that being trans is rape by appropriating women's body by Janice Raymond. And let's be honest, that's never going to happen because this is a slope that obviously isn't based in reality. Next up is a take she did on this in regards to indirect bigotry. Two different styles of bigotry. They express the same prejudice, but they're very different in tone. I'll call the two styles direct bigotry and indirect bigotry. Direct bigotry is openly contemptuous. It's a bigotry manifested in slurs and outright discrimination and demonizing the target group and calls for shunning, subordination, or even violence. Whereas indirect bigotry manifests as concern or debate about a host of proxy issues. It's often defensive in tone rather than offensive. Frequently the claim is that a once needed liberation movement has now gone too far, that it's now the activists who are the new oppressors, who are disturbing law and order with violent and chaotic protests, who are victimizing and silencing innocent people by calling them bigots, who are infiltrating the media and replacing good old fashioned entertainment with politically correct propaganda. And of course, ordinary people are too intimidated to speak out against it because cancel culture is out of control and free speech is under attack. This is technically still a part of her video on JK Rowling, but it deserves its own section since it can be applied to everything within progressive thought, not just transgender athletics. And it's important because it really shows the problem behind why ContraPoints relies on slippery slopes and equating criticism and concerns to hate so much. She genuinely seems to believe that this type of reasoning where you take something innocuous and falsely accuse it of being or at least will eventually lead to something hostile, she seems to really think that this is a valid form of argument. And unfortunately, it's not just ContraPoints. You have probably seen this type of dishonesty before coming from other people. Heck, just go to Plebit and browse any woke scold board, you will see legions of woke midwits shooting this argument in every which direction, sometimes even against each other, and often over the dumbest shit you can imagine. It happens all the time. I can even practically guarantee that if this video gains any level of notoriety, the progressive slippery slope will be shot in my direction as well, despite the fact that I am preemptively calling it out and explaining why it's an invalid argument. It's like the idea that there can be legitimate criticism of someone who is in a subjective victim class is an alien concept to them, and this sort of traps them in a form of circular logic. Everyone who brings criticism or concerns to the cult of woke is a bigot and therefore wrong, and they know the concern is not legitimate because it comes from bigots, and they know those critics are bigots because they criticize them, and they know the concern isn't valid because the critics are bigots, and they know their critics are bigots because round and round their logic goes, where does it stop? Nobody knows. So what we have here is a critical flaw in the ideology of wokeness. Because these people cannot see beyond the oppressor-victim false dichotomy, any criticism at all against a perceived victim is deemed automatically invalid, regardless of the facts. This is not a rational way of looking at the world for three basic reasons. First off, and most obviously, it doesn't invalidate the criticism or concerns. For instance, saying 1 plus 1 should equal 3 because it would somehow benefit an allegedly marginalized group obviously does not change the fact that 1 plus 1 does in fact not equal 3, and it certainly doesn't mean that anyone who points out that 1 plus 1 equals 2 is somehow being a bigot. And I'm sure anyone with a basic level of intellect should be able to easily understand this, at least in regards to basic math. And yet, in woke philosophy, I regularly see well-educated people with supposedly above-average intelligence making this exact same argument, just that it's obfuscated by woke identity politics, so it's not immediately obvious that they are guilty of the same nonsensical reasoning. Here's a novel concept, if you consider criticism to be invalid, then respond to it and explain why it's invalid. False accusations of bigotry are not real arguments. This is important because concerns and criticism aren't automatically bad. It can be, and often is, constructive. Ignoring that criticism by denying its right to exist can actually weaken a movement by making it so it doesn't improve as a result of constructive criticism. Second, victimhood is not a real virtue, especially when it's applied to as a group. When you try to apply these group instances to the individual, it's often just going to 
result in a fallacy of averages. For instance, it would be pretty interesting to see ContraPoints in a room with the other girls who had to compete against Leah Thomas, and seeing ContraPoints explain to them that any concern those ladies might have is actually a form of bigotry. I suspect Natalie would find that clamoring over collective victimhood in the face of people who have had the opposite experience as individuals wouldn't exactly be so easy for her. And in the unlikely event that ContraPoints responds to this video, I actually challenge her to answer what she would say to those athletes in such a scenario. Third is the question of, who exactly gets to decide what the victim group is? The answer is the people in charge. For instance, if you put racial supremacists in charge of any type, they could easily just twist things to say that their racial group are the victims, and thus any criticism of anything they do is invalid, and then use their position to silence opposition. You see, using sophistry to justify slippery slopes and demand immunity from criticism can easily be flipped around to justify the exact opposite position. This is one of the biggest problems with collectivist identity politics. It's very easy to flip the script without actually changing the rationale behind it, simply by swapping around which identity groups are favored and which groups are being painted as the villains. This is why free speech needs to be defended. Attempts to regularly redefine what bigotry means with such a wide brush in order to suit whatever point they are trying to make is a classic woke scolding move. They will give bigotry a broader meaning than just outright hate in one point, and then go right back to defining it as outright hate in their next point. This is textbook equivocation. The ultimate goal here is to psychologically manipulate you into accepting that anything she doesn't like politically is bigotry. And therefore, if you don't agree with the cult of woke and their often collectivist nonsense, that makes you a bigot. Don't fall for it. Using Natalie's own words, the fact that a basic human right like free speech has been snuck on this list should raise a massive red flag that all of this is just thinly veiled authoritarianism. So for some final examples of the progressive slippery slope, let's look at some blurbs. Once you realize that a lot of ContraPoint's content relies on this argument, it becomes pretty easy to spot. And my goal in this video is to hopefully get people to the point where everyone watching it becomes somewhat savvy at exposing and identifying this dishonest grift for what it is by themselves. So here are some extra examples from a few other videos that don't really need a long-winded explanation. An irreverent, bad boy, atheist comedian was ranting on Twitter for days and days about how stupid it is that people are offended by things. This is pretty standard for Ricky Gervais, a man whose personal branding screams, I don't care about your feelings. I know what it's like to be persecuted for my beliefs. I am too much of a badass rebel to care what minorities think. Yeah, I'm sure that's totally what he meant. An edgy comedian joking about being offensive is definitely secretly a turbo bigot. Big problem here. And the problem is that all of this life coaching is basically just a Trojan horse for a reactionary political agenda. Peterson advocates an ethics of self help, not merely as a guide to private life, but as a replacement for progressive politics, which he characterizes as totalitarian and evil. There's no comparison between That's... Mao and a trans activist, is there? Why not? The philosophy that's guiding their utterances is the same philosophy. When so-called activists are trying to silence free speech by deliberately misrepresenting their views, yeah. But on a more serious note, this is another case of ContraPoints accidentally admitting to the flaws in woke philosophy without intending to. What exactly is wrong with alternatives to progressive politics? Are all alternatives just automatically assumed to be bad? Why do we need to lock ourselves into the false dichotomy of woke collectivism versus Nazi collectivism? Revolution. Revolution to end capitalism. Okay, so you're saying that your plan is to do a communist revolution and overthrow the US government. That's very valid. You know, when the far right talks about violence and overthrowing the government, they actually mean it. And you know they mean it because they have literal militias, the three percenters, the boogaloo boys. They're stockpiling weapons and training to use them. They have ex-military men in their ranks and connections to white supremacists within the police and the military. Whereas, when leftists talk about revolution on Twitter, it strikes me as ideation, not intent. You know, psychiatrists have this distinction between two kinds of suicidal thinking. So there's intent, which is when you have a plan for how you're gonna do it, and then they have to commit you because you're a danger to yourself. And then there's ideation, which is you know, you're not actually gonna do it, but you just have that inner monologue that's constantly saying, I just wanna die. And at last, we get to the bottom of what's really going on here. 
She treats ideas of revolution from the far left as a mountain to climb, highly unlikely, and the same talk from the far right as a sure-to-happen domino effect. Slippery slopes are usually considered fallacious precisely because they are not domino effects, but a series of steps that must happen in order to get from one point to another. For instance, take a 20-something-year-old right-winger who posts a Pepe the Clown meme on his Facebook page. He wouldn't just go from Pepe memes to being an unironic national socialist or joining some fringe boogaloo movement in an instant. Rather, there would be a series of steps and various beliefs he would have to accept and adopt, leading to those steps which then eventually lead to that kind of radicalization. Let's say for the sake of argument and giving an example that there are 10 of these steps and the chance of each happening is 51%. At first, if you don't think about it too hard, that might seem pretty bad since each step has a slightly above average chance of happening. But the problem is that each of them needs to happen to reach the end catastrophic result. This is understood in statistics as the simple function x sub y, and so the overall probability of a to z actually calculates that a less than 1% chance of happening. That's why slippery slopes can be so deceptive to the average person, because at first glance, it might seem entirely plausible until you consider the total possibility of the entire slope happening as a whole. And then it becomes clear that the entire argument is completely insane. And the thing is, Natalie seems to understand this, but only shows it when dealing with the left. She acknowledges that most far-left revolutionary edgelords on Twitter are just kids talking smack, and the actual chances of most of them ever seriously leading down the path of steps needed to unironically take part in a violent communist revolution is fairly low. But of course, she only acknowledges that these steps are not a domino effect when referring to the people who supposedly share views closer to her own, while anyone else, on the other hand, is just assumed to be inevitably headed down the rabbit hole without any solid evidence. So anyways, time for the conclusion. You might recall at the start of this video, I mentioned that something interesting happens when you take the progressive slippery slope away from contrapoints. I found that when she isn't relying on woke scolding or using slippery slopes, a lot of her content is... Honestly, not that bad. Sometimes even delving into things that the right and libertarians would agree with, for instance from her video on Envy. So, you might think that Envy is simply the product of inequality, and that societies that have more inequality have more Envy. I used to assume that too, but the more I think about it, the more I realize that might not be true. Envy is a basic part of human nature. It exists in all societies and all economic systems, and it begins Anytime two or more people start comparing themselves. The person on the right could have said that too. One of the biggest differences between the left and right these days is that those of us more towards the right acknowledge that a huge part of the problems with humanity is in fact humanity itself. We aren't perfect creatures by any stretch, and so trying to fix certain things by force, such as forced equality, in hopes envy and other human condition related problems will just magically go away, is incredibly foolish. There was also her take on incels, where a lot of what she had to say is similar to the advice from Jordan Peterson. Now, it's pretty tempting to just mom the shit out of these kids. You wanna grab them by their Black Ops t-shirts, shake them a bit, and tell them there are millions of men with small wrists and weak chins getting laid every day, that they're their own worst enemies, that they need to get off the computer, go outside, make some friends, stop hating women, get some hobbies, and who knows, maybe they'll develop a disposition that women find a little more approachable. Essentially, you wanna tell them, clean your room, bucko. In fact, for the young men in this demographic who are receptive to that kind of advice, Jordan Peterson is probably helpful. I've looked a lot into incel culture and also concluded that they essentially doom themselves by locking down in an echo chamber of bad advice and so-called black pills about women that are highly exaggerated. And so good advice to incels is that they need to stop seething and leave their echo chamber. In other words, to take personal responsibility and learn to become better men. Again, things conservatives have told incels in the past. There's also the video on justice, which recognized that a lot of human sadism when viewing someone get their comeuppance is deeply ingrained into human psychology. People who ruin society through stupidity and aggressive actions towards others ignite feelings that they should be removed from society? Really? Surprised Pikachu face. These days it often can seem like people on the left and the right are completely different creatures that can never be reconciled. But the truth is, left and right is actually more of a false dichotomy. I only call myself a right-leaning libertarian because it's what my views usually align with. But just a basic look at history shows that these things are constantly in flux. People in political parties obviously change over time, and so really the only dichotomies that matter are things like truth versus lies, or rational versus the absurd. When it comes to contrapoints, her content, when she is being rational, and not just pandering to woke toids, tends to subly mirror what you can find on the intellectual dark web. While I sincerely doubt this means that ContraPoints will ever become a right-wing channel, that would be just as absurd a slippery slope as many of the arguments I just went over, I wouldn't be surprised if she starts to lean more towards being an unapologetic neoliberal like Destiny in the near future. She's already, honestly, more than halfway there. 
But as far as the progressive slippery slope goes, you can spot it as the following pattern. 1. They take something innocuous which the Cult of Woke doesn't agree with. Step 2. They employ sophistry to misrepresent what was said as something that will either lead to a bigoted outcome or make the unfalsifiable accusation that the person who said it secretly meant something far more nefarious by associating it to a more extreme position. Step 3. Accuse their target of acting bigoted based on the slippery slope that has been constructed. Step 4. Shift the burden of proof onto the accused to prove that the slope is not valid. That about sums it up. So thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, feel free to like, subscribe, leave a tip if you feel like it, and all that stuff. Till next time.